friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa Stringworks Workshop. For calendar reference, today is October 30th, the day before Halloween. And I'm proud to announce that I have yet another commission to build another guitar. You may recall from a prior video that I announced that I already had a commission to build like an OM guitar. That is still true. I still have received the deposit to get started on that. But the customer is supposed to be supplying me with a specific kind of set of plans, uh, mostly taken from the guitar that he presently owns. And anyway, there's just been some red tape involved in that and I haven't received it yet. So I have since received yet another commission to build another guitar. And this particular guitar is uh, going to be built just like the one I built for the fellow out in California. That was video series number 225 if you want to check it out. The back and sides were made out of Paduk. The top was made out of spruce. And you may recall that I put a uh, armrest built into the side of that guitar. And for the most part, uh, this guitar is going to be pretty much identical. Um, the customer really liked that guitar a lot, and he wants one pretty much just like it. The other thing you may recall is that we used no plastics on it whatsoever. We, you know, you had your metal tuning keys, and pretty much the rest was wood and everything was natural color. Now this particular guitar that I'm getting ready to build is gonna to go to South Carolina. So I don't know what we're gonna name this guitar yet, but uh, we'll be thinking on that. If you come up with a good name, you can put that in the comments. I'll show you what I've got sitting here on my table. To This is kind of my resources to get started with. So I have quite a bit of Paduk laying here. I've gone through my pile to find out what I have. There's, these are smaller pieces. Then I've got this fairly large piece here. And I have this very large piece. This is nearly seven feet long. This one is uh, only about oh, three feet long or something like that. And it's roughly wide enough to make a guitar, I believe, on the sides. Let me double check and see if it is. Yeah, it's, it's wide enough. That's just right, in fact. Let's see if it's long enough. I think it's long enough, too. Yeah, it is. It's long enough. So we'll start with this piece, and we're going to cut sides out of this for this guitar. This is probably the most difficult part of building a guitar, in my opinion, because so much can go so wrong so fast. It's raining really hard outside, so you may hear that in the background. We're at the joiner, and the very first thing I'm going to do before I cut this to length even is I want to get one flat edge. Uh, it is actually very flat. I looked down at it, it looks pretty good. But I think, you know, it's been sitting in the shop here for years, and it won't hurt to run it through there and make sure that it's perfect. <laughs> That looks really good, so we'll start with that. We're gonna cut this piece off to length. 31 and a half inches should do it. Don't wanna to have to rip any more than I have to with this stuff, it's just hard to rip. And I said hard to rip, what I really meant was resaw. We're gonna to have to resaw this, so we don't wanna resaw any more than we have to, so even cutting off that much helps on the resaw. Once again, for resaw purposes, I want to cut off everything I don't need to resaw. So it's a little too tall or this way for the sides. And by the way, this board has been split a little bit on this edge. So we're going to cut all that away and just be left with the amount that we really need. And I have the fence set at 4 and 13 sixteenths, which is a sixteenth of an inch wider than the finished sides for the most part. That cleaned it up just perfectly, and we're ready to start the resaw, which, like I said, is the nail-biting time. Here we go. I have made a test block of wood. This block here is exactly the same thickness as the board I'm about to resaw. This is just a piece of scrap wood. It's a softwood redwood, I believe. Anyway, I have got a half inch blade in here that I use for resawing. It's got the bigger teeth, you know, which helps for resawing. It helps move the dust away. 
I am going to try to get four slices of wood out of this. And I have this set, you know, I've done some very careful calculations. And hopefully when I get done with this, all four pieces will be about the same thickness. I don't even really care if they are, if they, uh, you know, all I care is that they're thick enough. And if all four pieces are thick enough, whether they're the same size or not, it doesn't matter. Well, let's test and see how thick they are. 160 thousandths, which, which should be plenty to get what I need. 163 thousandths. The 159 thousandths. And then the last piece was thicker, 222 thousandths. So with that in mind, I could probably bump this that, that way just, just ever, ever so slightly. I'm gonna put on my glasses and get down here and look at this and just move it that way, just a hair. Well, we're at the nail biting time. Uh, every board of this is precious to me because I only have this amount, I don't have any more. And getting more of this high quality is not that easy to do, and it's very expensive. So, here we go. Keep your fingers crossed. I'm an old dirt farmer. I scrape a living from so. It would be hard to find a piece more beautiful than that. That's just about as beautiful as it gets when it comes to wood. And that's 170 thousandths. That's just about where I want to be, I believe. So I think we're good to go. Hopefully the next one cuts as good. Like my father before me Once again, that turned out just about as perfect as you can do. Now what I'm going to do is take a pencil and I'm going to put marks across this so that I'll know how to line this back up. So those three marks there will help me line this up if I, if I get them separated. So those two pieces will go together, and then lastly, these last two pieces should go together, and we're gonna go ahead and saw that right now while we've got it set up. You should move away. You said farm life is dying. Son, please don't stay. I moved to the city. Well, I believe we got away with it. This last piece came out a little bit thin, but I think it's still plenty thick to make a guitar side, so we're good enough. That's all I care about, so it didn't ruin the pieces. That's the main thing. It's time for that not so much fun task of taking these sideboards down to their final thickness. I'm at my homemade thickness sander, and we'll run them through until we're satisfied. As you may have just seen, I just finished sanding these two pieces down to the proper thickness. Now even though they're only about 75 thousandths thick, which isn't very thick, they're still very stiff. You can see a very slight bow to that board. It's, and the reason it's bowing is because it is very heavy. Even though this is thin, it's still a heavy board <laughs> for as thin as it is. 
you know, it, and so the weight of it will cause it to bend a little bit, but it's very stiff, very stiff board. I don't know if it'll make a note. It's hard to make a good note with a thin board like that, but, but to my ear, it almost sounds like I'm tapping on sheet metal. I, it's, it's that hard, and you can hear it, a very clear note, gonna be an excellent pair of sides. It's just about as pretty of parasites as you can get. The only slight negative is there is a little slight growth in there. It's not really anything that you can do anything about. It just is part of it, you know. It's the way nature grew it. What I will try to do, though, is uh, these are cut on an angle, so I, I'll be able to cut out a little bit more of that yet even. Not that it really matters. Uh, in a way, it's kind of a beauty mark. Actually, on this side, you see it a little bit less, so I may have that as the outside. But uh, anyway, it is, as I say, what it is. Because nature grew it, I didn't do that. It's gonna be a boomer. I need to sand these sides a bit before we do the bending. I wanna, you know, sand out the other sanding marks, if you will. When you run them through your thickness sanders, <clears throat> those sanders have a little bit coarser sandpaper. The one I built, I think the sandpaper is 100 grit or something like that, which is pretty fine for a sander. But I've got 220 here, and I'm going to sand these sides with the 220. Now, I, I want to say this up front to knock down the comments, because I get this comment over and over and over and over, and I'll tell you why I don't do it. People keep telling me, there's a trick you can do. You can use the, you know, uh, masking tape, uh, CA glue, and then another strip of masking tape to hold something down to your table. Yes, I'm totally, completely, 100% familiar with that. And I've even done it on a rare occasion. But you can't do that on really delicate parts. And you say, why can't you? Well, it. I say that's... You can't. You can on in certain circumstances, but in this circumstance, I'll show you why you can't do that, or you, at least I wouldn't do that. These boards are incredibly thin. They're um, just a little over a sixteenth of an inch. They're seventy-five thousandths. Okay, well that's really thin. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about taking a piece of masking tape like this. And I, you know, you put it down, I, I'm just using this as an example. You, you put it down, you put CA glue on top of that, you put this one upside down on top of that, and the CA glue holds them, and, and you stick your board on here like this. And then, and then when you want to take your board off, you just, you just basically are peeling away from the masking tape. But that holds this thing still. Well, there's two problems with using that technology with this kind of stuff. First of all, and you may think I'm exaggerating, but you can look at this wrong and split this. I mean, it cracks easy. It's such, it's perfectly quarter sawed. It's only this, it's only a sixteenth of an inch thick and you know, the, the grain runs down the length of it. So it doesn't take anything to break it. So if you stick this down with any kind of a sticky backing and you try to peel it up, odds are you're gonna crack it when you try to take it up, even if it's just masking tape. You will likely break it. Not saying you will break it every time. That's not even the biggest problem. That's just one of the problems with sticking this kind of thin stuff down to your table. If it's a quarter inch thick, no problem at all. You can do it. But also being this thin, when you put two layers of tape under here, like if you put it under this edge and put it under this edge, then that leaves a low spot in the middle. And when you start sanding it, you're sanding, you're sanding off of this edge, you're sanding off this edge, and the low spot doesn't get sanded. It will, it will actually thin the edges. When you, wherever your tape is, it will be thinner right there where the tape is when you start using a sander like this. So I choose to either hold it with something, like put something down on top of it and clamp it, or just do it by hand. Right at the moment, I'm just gonna hold it by hand and see how that works, and if it doesn't work, well then we'll clamp it down. So that's why I don't always do this method. 
It's not a bad method, it just doesn't work with this really thin, very brittle type wood. That's working really well, but I need a dust, dust mask. got my pattern here and I'm drawing it onto the side. This was that little scar area right here so we're going to cut off most of the little scar or the little uh, growth or whatever you want to call that. It's not a big deal but at least you know we can make use of the pattern and cut some of that off this way. I just have to book match the other side. I think I've already got it set up that way, but I need to double check it here just to make sure I don't screw up. I just couldn't leave I think we're good there. I'll double check it again before I do any cutting. Well, I got the small blade back on the bandsaw and I'm ready to saw these out. I've got my light way over here to shine against that pencil mark so I can see the pencil mark better. Knew I would stay. Now I'm an old dirt farmer. I scrape a living from the soul. Like my father before me. We're about ready to start trying to bend our side. We just spritz it with some water first. I kind of have it marked about where I need to bend it. I labor and toil. That didn't bend at all so far. This is a very hard wood. I can tell you for sure it's not an easy wood to bend. Let's spritz the outside and Try to stretch the fibers on the outside by doing it this way. Well, you can see a slight bend in it now. That's going to take some bending. This is going to be fun. I tell you, I, it's one of my least favorite things to do is to bend guitar sides. But on the other hand, this new tool helps a lot. sure is fighting me I'll tell you that it doesn't want to stay there it's a springy piece of wood very stiff piece of wood but it's gonna work it's just gonna take a little extra effort I'm 
not going to film much more of that just because it's the same thing over and over and over and over, but I'll show you what it looks like when I get her there. I can tell you for sure there are days when you fight it and there are days when it goes easy. Today is one of those days where I had to fight it. That was one of the hardest ones I've ever bent. I don't know why it just didn't want to hold the bend. I finally got it. I wrestled with it about three or four times longer than it normally should take me. And, and even then, it's still not what I call really, you know, holding the shape. It's, you know, it's got its memory and it wants to be straight, I can tell you. And so I've just got this all forced into the mold, as you can see here. And I've got braces on it holding it out. And they're holding it to the exact shape of the mold, so it's, it's conforming to the shape. But man, it was not easy at all. That was really very, very, very hard. So all I can say is we got that one. I'm going to give it a rest overnight and uh, think about doing the next one tomorrow because, you know, whenever you're working that hard fighting it, there's something not working right. Maybe it's just my mood or attitude or something I don't know but we'll just uh, wait and try the other one tomorrow well I'm trying to bend the second side even the first one I'm still not really happy with the first one to be perfectly honest with you I mean it's bent but it's not holding the shape real well this stuff is, is difficult to bend and keep it in shape is a struggle you can see my process I'll show you what it looks like when we get there well today is day three on working on this basically day one I just bent this side day two I bent this side and now day three I'm gonna put this together with the end blocks and I first you know they overlap both pieces overlap here and here and so I'm gonna to have to make a straight cut down through there I could mark it and take it out and cut it and that would probably be the easiest in the long run maybe <laughs> you know and I've done it that way many times before but I've got the idea that I may just cut this in place with a sharp knife it doesn't really matter if it's a perfect cut or not you know it because the necks gonna cover this joint and then there will be a decorative tail joint back there anyway so that the perfect joint isn't what I'm after Although cutting it with a knife may actually give me the perfect joint. So, I mean, it can go both ways. But my main reason or concern why I'm wanting to just cut it in place is just simply because this wood has its own mind and its own memory. <laughs> you know, it's almost like it's alive. And, and it is alive in a very real sense. Now, I don't mean alive like it's living, breathing, obviously. I mean alive like there's a lot of motion in this wood. There's a lot of springiness. Um, this wood uh, springs back about half of what you bend it. In other words, if you were to, you know, consider this being a straight line through here, like on this one side, and, you know, you can see I've bent this approximately a 90 degree angle, and I'll actually over bend it and hold it on the bending iron until it dries in, in a 
tighter angle than the 90, and yet it will spring back to about this angle here. So it just doesn't like to stay bent. It wants to come back to its straight point. Now, other woods that are less alive, if you will, like maple, for instance, I could bend that and put it in here and there would be no tension whatsoever. But I'm not kidding you, this is under tension. I mean, I'm not trying to fool anyone. There's no doubt this wood is under tension. Now, is that a bad thing? Well, I guess I'd prefer a minimal amount of tension. I do kind of like a little tension. I think it gives the wood, you know, something to uh, vibrate with. It's, it's, it's very springy. It, it's alive, just like I say. It's, you know, versus just a totally dead piece of wood that's just laying there. Now, the, the positives are that I think it helps the sound. I personally really believe that. But on the other, the negative is that it's under tension. And, and these sides being so thin and very quarter sawn are very susceptible to splitting. And under tension, I would say they're probably even slightly more susceptible to, to uh, splitting. So if you were to bang this on the corner of a table, it's most likely going to result in a split. So that's another reason that we'll be reinforcing the sides a little bit once we uh, you know, get everything going and you'll see the little strips of uh, fabric that we'll put across there, which Martin does that too, so that's nothing unusual. Point is that it fits the mold pretty darn well. You know, I've got these extra clamps on this side here because this side right here was just a little bit not, you know, and I mean, when I say a little bit, I mean like a sixteenth of an inch from fitting the mold perfectly. Uh, maybe even less than that. So I'm just pulling them in there because I want to get it out to the full size of the mold before I cut these joints. My combination square sitting on the base of this. The sides are pushed down square to that. I'm just going to lightly score it with a brand new blade and I'm just going to score it and not really try to make a big bunch of progress and cut through it. I could probably break it off, but I don't want to. So I'm going to think about this a second, see if I can come up with a little better approach. I'm just trying this method with my saw, and it's working, but not, not great, but it's working. Well, that got it off of there. And now, if I could use this block as a straight edge to start my next cut. Yeah, I think I'll get it done that way. I'm going to make this block a little thinner. It's too thick. I could get the block and make the block for this end and clamp it in place or I could go ahead and cut the other one. I guess I'll go ahead and cut the other one first. Again my hand will probably cover most of what you're seeing here but I went and got the scalpel that Chuck gave me and uh, anyway I think that might even be a better tool for cutting this now that I thought it through a little bit.
it's out of there. Yeah, it was a little more work than I was expecting, but it worked and we got the job done. Okay, so I've got this set to cut for a tail block out of this piece of sycamore. And I like to use good hardwoods that don't split easy for these blocks, especially for the neck. So I think this is going to work really well. You can see this is off by 0.45 of an angle of one degree. So I am just going to zero this out. Now it, it's flat with the bed, and now I'm going to tilt the saw. Well, I didn't have that in camera, but you can see I'm five hundredths of one degree off, I guess you'd say. Or I don't know how to read that thing. It's just off by 0.05 of a degree is the best way I can explain it. So there you go. That's pretty close to 45. I think we'll call that good. You're looking at it from the back side of the saw, and that dark thing you're seeing is the shadow. This is the blade here. It's hard to see it in the camera. But anyway, we're going to run this through and just knock the corners of this block off. This is the tail block. Now here's a good look at the tail block up close. We're going to check the thickness. I wanted to get it exactly an inch, and I think I'm just a little bit over that, so I'll probably run this through my thickness sander, but other than that, it's ready to go. Not that we need this much precision. Actually, I'm about one thousandth of an inch too thick. Sue me. Well, I've got glue spread on the block. I've got a line, I've got a line on here marking the center, and I've got a mark on my mold here marking the center. So that block is in place and I believe it's in perfect shape. Now we'll do the neck block. Pretty well covers that. I got good, good glue squeeze out all the way around so I know it's got a good making good contact. I've got the camera positioned around behind the bandsaw as you can see and I am now cutting the kerf lining for the guitar and it's just a miter jig. It's just a little miter uh, jig here with a piece of wood screwed to it. It's just a shelf to hold this on there. And then I have a mark right here and I just slide it over to that mark each time I want to cut a new curve. Very simple process. see one finished piece. I've got quite a few more pieces of that to cut. We're just about ready to put the kerf lining in on this side. This is the back that is up, just so you know. The top is actually facing down right now, if you were thinking of it that way. need a little piece in here yet it, to finish it out right through here which I don't think you can see real well but well, friends this is what you see when you live out in the country these are called frost flowers sorry about the motor running in the background that's my car it's kind of cold out here so I'm leaving it running but you can see all these frost flowers let's get up close to a couple here that maybe you can see the detail in them. 
They look like cotton candy almost this morning. They, they look different ways on different days. This is more typical up here, this one right there in the middle. You can see how it's kind of flaked out. And here's a, another one. And that's just frost heaving up out of the ground. And it's kind of all over. You can see them in the background. Almost looks like mushrooms or something. For you folks that live in the city, you probably never get to see stuff like that. So I thought I'd just show that to you. I'm headed out this morning in my new RAV4 car. That's the one we took to uh, Canada. So we got it broke in real good. But I'm headed out this road this morning. This is our county road coming into our farm. And we're headed to Fulton, Missouri to go buy some spruce wood for the tops of a couple of guitars and maybe even for the top of another mandolin. We're here at Old Standard Wood and we're just showing you the warehouse of the tops, uh, mostly uh, spruce that's stacked up here. Well, there's a lot of maple here too, but uh, mostly for on this end here is mostly mandolins and uh, then there's a lot of guitar stuff and more guitar stuff back this way. There's a real nice piece of mandolin wood right there that he's showing off. Beautiful. And this is what I'm bringing home today and you can, I bought cars cheaper than this, believe it or not. <laughs> I survived my road trip to go get the, the wood. I ended up with some pretty decent pieces. You know, you could always argue that they could be better. It's difficult to tell anything about them in, in this way because they're rough sawn at the moment. This side has one bit of a planed area and you can see there's a dark streak or two down through it. But this is the real red spruce, which is the real Adirondack spruce. Not to be confused with white spruce, which is also sometimes called Adirondack spruce. This is the real stuff and it's a little more difficult to come by perfect pieces. And each one of these sets was $150, <laughs> as they are. Now, here's another very nice one. The, you can see a little bit of darkness in these lines too, but not too bad. Uh, this is probably the one I'll use on this guitar. The uh, tone is excellent. I doubt you, it'll come across, but There's all kinds of tone in this wood, so it's very, very good. So I know it'll make a very good sounding guitar, I have no doubt about that. That was $300 for the two top boards for guitars. That's a lot of money for just two little tiny boards, <laughs> you know, you think about it. And then I have another $40 invested in this mandolin top, and it's a very good piece of wood too, I'm very happy with it. And uh, so I'll just put this on the shelf for down the road. So I hope you enjoyed that look at uh, Old Standard Wood and uh, where I go to actually pick out my wood. It's very nice. I'm sure uh, if you're interested in buying some uh, high grade material, they can talk to you about it. I will just tell you straight up and down, don't expect to get the cheapest price. Uh, it's expensive wood and uh, it's pretty darn top quality stuff. Now you can get some cheaper wood there, uh, which would still make excellent instruments, don't get me wrong, but it will have little more lines in it or something like that. Uh, may not be the prettiest piece, but it'll sound real good too. So you can save money that way if you choose to. I, uh, I choose to go, uh, you know, in the upper echelon of the wood selection while I don't pick the very top best boards because they're like four hundred dollars you know for a set or more and uh, you know I truly don't think that the sound quality is going to be any better than on these you know because like I said I pick them up and I tap on them and I listen to them and uh, I'm real happy with the sound that, that I'm getting out of these so 
Friends, I interrupt this video to say thank you to Donald from Oratana, Pennsylvania. Or at least that's the way I'm pronouncing the town. I hope that's right. Oratana, Pennsylvania. Donald sent me this. A real nice pile of antler. Donald, thank you very kindly. Every one of those is useful. We can make uh, mandolin deer antler saddles out of those. And not to mention a few saddles for guitars and things as well. Thank you very kindly, my friend. Well, I'm at the point where I need to take the sides out of this mold and turn it over. Presently, the back is facing up, the top is facing down. And, you know, I could potentially, I guess, I guess I could put the back on this as it is, but I'd rather not. Uh, I'm afraid if I do that, it'll be too rigid and I might not be able to get it back down in the mold to put the other kerfing on the other side. And I'm also gonna build the armrest into the top on this one as well, like I did on the last one. So here we go, I gotta get it out of here first. It's really tight, I will say that. It's gonna be kind of a struggle. I used a uh, putty knife to get in under the blocks and lift it a little bit. I've got it started moving up and I'm just got to take it out of here. This is kind of a little dangerous thing. You could split the sides getting uneven pressure on something. Uh, so I'm just trying to get it out as evenly as I can without creating any trauma. Hopefully it will go back down in here. But before I do that, I'm gonna clean these ends up where the glue squeezed out. It's a wonders I get anything done around here with all the interruptions. You know, since I spoke to you last, I have repaired a computer problem for my daughter-in-law and I have also winterized the horse trailer slash camper for my wife. And now I'm back to this. <laughs> I have got it flipped upside down, as you can see. So the back is now down, the top is up. And I have gone around, the top should be level. So I've gone around with a ruler and I've checked it all the way around and it's perfectly flat all the way. I have wedges under here to hold it up to the right height. I have wedges under each rib here, under you know the waist, I guess you'd say there. And you know the end. This one the end is sitting on the on the bottom. So it's it's pretty stable. It's pretty solid. It's level everywhere. So I'm ready to start putting in the kerf on this. Now on this side, kerf goes all the way. But on this side, where your arm goes, I have to make a special kerf, special deal here where we can round it over and make an armrest. He wants it to be just like the. Uh, guitar in video number 225 so check that out if you're anxious to see ahead of what that's going to look like This piece should fit in there, but I better test it first just to make sure before I glue all over it. Yep, it's real good. The next thing I'm going to do is lay out for this armrest. I got a large piece of Paduke here, and you know, it, this is kind of baguette and bigash on where you're going to want to put this, to be perfectly honest with you. I'm sure that, uh, you know, Taylor has it exactly marked out in a certain spot. But for me, I try to, you know, just know where my arm's going to about center on this piece. And that's where we want it. Um, I, <clears throat> you know, took another guitar and, and, you know, a dreadnought and worked on it. And this is just about where my arm comes across there and plays it. And, you know, it can vary a little bit. Um, so that's the best I can do on that. You know, you just, you just put it where you think it goes. And that's just about all you can do. I've got a short pencil. I'm going to get underneath here and mark the curve. 
we've got the curve marked there. It's very nice. I feel fairly certain that it'd be tough to get a much tighter fit than that. That is about as tight as it needs to be. I'll get my dividers out, make a parallel mark across here, and then we'll just decide where to taper it off at. I've got my calipers set at a little more than twice the thickness of the other binding. I'm gonna cut it square to the side on both ends, and cut this out, and then when we put the kerf in here, then we'll taper this off down to the kerf to make it look good. That's just only gonna be seen on the inside. Nobody will ever see it on the outside, but uh, I'll know it and uh, you'll know it because you're seeing it on video. And this, I have to remember to leave it up the thickness of the top when I glue it in place. I cannot glue it down flush. That would be below the top grade. I have to leave it up at the height the thickness of the top when I glue this in place. It's simple, but it's complicated. pretty well we could there's a couple of ways to attack this I could glue it into place squared like this or I could go ahead and chisel this off and then glue it into place it's a little harder to glue it into place once this is chiseled off I could also you know cut this off later after it's glued in with the Dremel tool uh, I don't know I'll have to think on that just a little bit to make my decision. Well, I've done all the thinking I can do and I'm going to go ahead and glue it in here. It might be a mistake to glue it in here in this big block and then have to cut this out later, but I pretty sure I can do that later with a Dremel tool and or my finger planes. I didn't do it that way the last time, but I think I can do it and I think it'll be fine. I got me a hundred thousandth spacer here, which is basically the thickness of the top. And so I'm laying that on the edge of the guitar and bringing this new piece up to that level. So that when I route this out in here to lay the guitar in here, that it'll be, you know, it'll have a shelf to lay on there. Once again, I don't know how much of that I got because I don't think I had the camera click double time there. The older I get, the more that seems to be a problem. I don't know if there's a correlation or what. But anyway, I got this little piece glued in between here and here, and I'm going to add this piece in to finish up to the neck block. takes care of all the kerf lining around the top and the back. Yeah, yeah. 